Well, hello and welcome to this Meet the Musician event, um, proudly sponsored by Plan B Wealth Management. Uh, I'm Claire Stokes, Artistic Program Coordinator at the um, Australian Symphony Orchestra, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Rob Gladstone's, our principal third horn. Um, so, obviously, this was a completely Beethoven program, mm -hmm. and there's, there's not many composers that, that we can do that for. Um, so, what is it, do you think, about Beethoven that just makes him so popular? you know, 200 years after he was around and that we can listen to a whole concert full of Beethoven? I think there's just something aesthetically pleasing about the, the, the structure and form of the music. Um, you know, Bach is another composer that's the same. You listen to Bach and, you, you know, you just feel the internal workings of the music and how it all fits together with the harmonies and the themes. And I think it's the same with the Beethovens. Um, you know, he, he just had it just right. Yeah, and, and I guess it's sort of the innovation as well in terms of leading the way in, in music at that time. Oh, oh definitely. Um, I mean, this was, this was groundbreaking, this, this symphony, very much so. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's actually in the program, but I know Haydn was quoted as saying, this changes everything when you heard it. So, yeah, it was definitely very new. Yeah, it's incredible. Even just the length of mm. it, is, it was so so much bigger than, than anything before and the first movement is is as long as some complete symphonies. Yes. So it's, it's quite incredible. And so one thing we saw in, in the Eroica was three French horns, including yourself, um, as opposed to the two in the other two pieces. Uh, so how does that work? We've got two in, in some of the classical works, we've got three in the Eroica and then of course after that you get more horns. Yeah. Um, it's a... I, th I, th I think... He found this trio. He didn't write that the, the, the horn trio that you heard, the, the, uh, the hunting call. He didn't actually write that. He stole that from somewhere else. Um, I believe it might have been possibly the, out of a piece by Frescobaldi, because I have played a brass choir piece arranged to Frescobaldi where that trio appeared to the shock of everybody playing. It was, what the? Um, <laughs> we, no, we all stopped playing and, and broke down in, in hysterics. And, uh, but they hadn't stole that. And I think to get, he, he wanted to put that trio in, and he, of course, needed three horns to do it. So he, Put a third horn part in and um, it's interesting how he uses me because the first two horns uh, historically horns used to work in pairs there used to be a, a high horn and a low horn and um, they would actually be like a partnership and they would, they would work together for their whole lives some of them and if one of them if they moved to a, you know a different city they'd both go and they'd both always work together and so it's unusual to have more than two horns up until that time although Mozart wrote symphony with four horns but what he did was he had two pairs of horns, two, one first horn, second horn, then another first horn, second horn, and they were in different keys, and um, they were able to fill in all the notes, as I said, but horns didn't have valves back in those days, and they only had a very limited number of notes they could play. So, um, for example, in the third movement, uh, the slow movement, the second movement of this one, the first and second horns are crooked in C, which means they have quite a long lot of tubing, which gives them a harmonic series based on a C concert on the piano. Uh, whereas I'm still in E flat, which means I have a harmonic series based on E flat, which means I've got the minor third, um, which you can't, you couldn't, couldn't have done if I was in the same key as the other two horns. So I'm able to put the minor third into the chord. Now, working in a symphony orchestra is a full-time job, and for some people that's enough. But for a lot of our musicians, it's not enough, and they all have other things they like to do. You have a, another job, or slash hobby, but but you get paid for it, um, servicing and repairing instruments. So how did you get into that? Um, I've always had an interest in it. Um, going back to my student, uh, when I was in high school, my teacher, because the former principal horn was uh, many years ago, um, he used to work for a horn maker in America. And um, he, he sort of piqued my interest in, in instrument repair and, and how instruments are done. I didn't really do anything about it until about six or seven years ago. and. Um, uh, circumstances allowed me to, well, circumstances forced me to start thinking I could do it myself because I saw a few repairs on instruments that uh, fell apart after you know, a very short time and very dodgy and I just felt it was, um, I felt like I could have done it myself. So I read up a lot, invested in the tools and um, uh, I've been doing it ever since. Great. And um, in, in the Meet the Musician section in the program, which also features Rob, uh, you mentioned you might repair or service up to about 200 instruments a year, which yep. is huge. Do any, do any of those include some of the instruments we see out in the orchestra? Um, yes, yes, I, I do some of the Wazo instruments when, when they're needed. Um, 
just recently I did the instruments that belong to the Education Chamber Orchestra, the Have A Go instruments, and very kindly you know, donated to us by Yamaha. And they um, uh, they get, when after we've finished the concert, the, the small children get up and have a go. Um, you know, and the instruments get a bit, bit filthy and you know, a bit beaten up. And so, yeah, it's just a matter of cleaning them off. I've, I've, um, I gave the Wagner tubers a good check over before the first performance because tubers do sit in the uh, storeroom doing nothing for most, most of the year. And I've also um, worked on the rotary trumpets. I read recently that the horn was the most difficult instrument to play. Do you agree with that? Oh, definitely. <laughs> I'll just repeat the question. It was, um, she heard recently that the horn is the most um, difficult instrument to play. Mm -hmm. And is that true? And oh. apparently so. De de definitely. I mean, um, when, you, when you teach, you realise how, how difficult it really is watching you know, um, kids struggle to, to, you know, to come to terms with it. Yes, yeah, what's your question? I want to know why your instrument is so dull. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my instrument is unlacquered, uh, so it's just, it's bare metal. Uh, whereas uh, Rachel, who is sitting next to me tonight, uh, she has exactly the same horn, but hers is lacquered. So it, the shine is, it's buffed up in the, in the, in the um, workshop and then, then has a clear lacquer put over the top so it contains that you shine. You don't have a complex? No. In actual fact, I, some, somewhere in the United States, I believe somebody did a study that actually proved that unlacquered horns actually have a slightly more ringing sound than lacquered horns because the um, outer layer of atoms on the metal aren't being locked in place. Well, thank you very, very much for coming along and listening tonight. And thanks to Plan B for supporting this. And above all, thank you, Rob, for joining us tonight. Yeah.